Here's another white man lying his ass off to me. Yeah, baby, I wrote a script for you. Oh, please. Green, scared, and pretty. Oh, ho, ho, are we gonna have fun. Oh, well, Roger Corman said, can you read? I said, I'm a college student, I can read. He says, no, can you read a script? I've never seen a script before. <laughs> so he says, you're perfect, uh, raw. Um, he, he, I said, I can't, I can't quit the five jobs that I have. I need to graduate. I need to go to UCLA film student. I've been accepted. I just need the money and I cannot walk away from my jobs. I, I really need to go to school. And you have to talk to my mom about it. So he said, I want you to get the book, The Actor Prepares by Stanislavski, Const Konstantin Stanislavski, and I did. And when I started reading, I'm a reader, student, it gave me a inside, a perspective of the actor, what the actor does, how it lives, how it lives in, in the heart and soul and shoes of a human being. And when I read it, it was frightening because my world had been one of attacks and rapes and beatings and chokings. And that was my reality. And I said, I don't know if I can participate, I won't know. It was therapy from day one. If I'm able to, and every movie I did, I didn't know if I'd be able to do another one because I stutter and I have trauma and I, when people want me to offer me something, I, can I commit? Can I really commit? Will this be the moment where I can't because I recall some horror or tragedy? So it's still a lesson. It's not easy. Uh, I have a high tolerance to pain and mental pain, but still, I, there's films that I turn down that I know I cannot take and revisit a traumatic experience. And it might win me that Oscar, but I'm not here for awards. I'm here to have people think and reconsider thoughts and judgment and process and the human process from so many cultures that we're being introduced to now. They wanted what I had lived through and observed and it was, you know, I had to, I knew what they were, were doing would allow a patriarchal society to accept a woman who, who could fight pugilistic, box, martial arts, when society was not prepared for that. They just, oh, women don't do that. Men do that, Men, women don't. Um, and I said, well, on the Air Force Base, we are in martial arts. and and. When women saw me do it, and girls, she did it, it looks like fun. And yes, it is. You have to be conditioned, but you learn the theory of women's martial arts that was global. My films would stay in the theaters and keep the mainstream films out because people would see a woman of color being successful, that's not a lot of popcorn. People would bring their kids three, four, five, six, seven times. So my films would stay there not just a week, but like seven like months. And the big studios said, we're gonna hit her. We're gonna kill her and bury her in the desert because her movies stay here so long. And um, they realized, well, why don't you build a multiplex? It's called a multiplex. And from what I did, wink, wink, I created, I had a, a lot to do with them creating the multiplex. Uh, in open spreads of, of land in suburbia. It seemed like I have this Forrest Gumpian way of touching something and it becomes a hit. Um, and that's what had happened. But I think because of me being a gymnast and a track star and a skier and a fisher and a, you know an angler for fishing and all of that that I learned in the country that it, it provided a, an authenticity, if you will, where Back home, that's all the girls, that's what we did, but city girls weren't allowed to, or southern girls. So once they saw it and, and loved it, enjoyed it, and still became, the belle of the ball, debutantes, still kept their femininity, they, they, it was tried and true that you wouldn't, wouldn't lose your femininity if you did things that only boys did. And, and boys liked it. You want to play with knives, huh? Well, you picked the wrong player. No. No, please, look, I didn't mean nothing. Please! Oh. I noticed that I was the only female 
actor, crew, executive in your, within 100 miles. And I said, I want to be able to share our cramps, share our side of music and clothing and what we think of, of the male side, the demonstrative side. And uh, I didn't want it to be in pieces, limited. But once they did, and, and they realized the audience were expansive as well. The audience saw themselves in the leads and the characters, and that's, that, that expanded the marketplace. And so sometimes you have to do it, build it and they will come. I, was, I came with the guns and the razor blades, that was good, and I could drive a tractor through a wall. So no, um, they, growing up not only in the airbase, but growing up in a hunting family in Wyoming, but the razor blades came from the urban um, activities and the urban gangs and people talking about, well, we're gonna have a fight tonight. Woohoo! Well, those big girls are coming over, they threaten us, we're gonna put razor blades in our hair. So, a lot of the experience that I've had growing up, I've been able to utilize in, in film and my storytelling. Coffee played in Pakistan, where I have the posters where a woman holding a gun is outlawed in Muslim countries. Iran, uh, Iraq, Pakistan, Morocco, Turkey. And they would show my film in a different place every night so that people wouldn't get caught and be killed or stoned watching my films. They made me look good. They gave me a six pack. Well, I don't think a woman has a six pack, but. And if they saw my coffee, well, Coffee, I did have a, a, a J.D. David, a good stuntman, but the stuntman in, in um, Big Dollhouse was a Filipino man covered in Max Factor chocolate covered makeup with a with a piece of carpet on his head for an Afro wig, and that was my male stuntman. He was about came up to my waist. I said, "So, you're my stuntman, really? Okay. You have to pad your bra. Do you know what that means? Nine, no, in the in the, como se poca yo, you know. So I, could, I learned Tagalog just to be able to figure out what they're saying." <sighs> to be here, you have no idea. A carpet and brown makeup and a guy who was half my size was my stunt double. So, so but anyway, I could pick him up and throw him across the room, which excited everybody, you know. They said, we won't have to do that one again. Get off, get off the goddamn fuck. I can't see where I'm going, Shit. The, the woman who is a little bit more aggressive, Ag more aggressive than coffee. Coffee was a grassroots communicator. Um, Foxy was strategically more radical and aggressive. And so I wanted to, to show that side of, of womanhood. Um, she was like my aunt who, my aunt basically was a Foxy Brown. She rode a Harley. She wanted to be an architect. She's beautiful. You know, that the song Brick House was wrote, written for her. And she's very smart and independent. And she could have children and take care of them without being married. She was way ahead of her time, which women are doing today, saying, well, before you cheat and walk away, you know, distance yourself from the family when you go take your ring off on a, you know, a business trip. Women had to be respected if they walked in a man's shoes. And to show that, it shook a patriarchal world and, and movie-going world. But when they came back from war, from the Vietnam War, women had to walk in those shoes and boots and do chores and cut grass and go to the hardware store. Bob Vila was my idol of this old house. He, he taught me and my mom how to take care of our home. My mom was ridiculed for cutting the grass. I was hoping that uh, Foxy Brown would segue into more Foxy Browns of all cultures, Asian, Swedish, Viking, princess, just to, to show that, well, sometimes you have to be a Foxy Brown. Sometimes you have to help be a partner. She was more of a equal partner. You know, she wanted that. And if something happened to her mate, she has just to step in. What are you doing here? I'm delivering the milk. <gasps>
I just wanted to sit at her feet and listen to her narratives. The people working with um, James Dean, Paul Newman, Marlon Brando, the great actors, and they talked of acting craft and their culture. And we just sit at her feet and just listen. Like a George Carlin. I'll sit at, sat at when I did Bill and Ted go, go to hell. I always said it, well, he's, he unzips me and steps out of me and he becomes Bill and Ted's hero. Um, people who have that knowledge and wisdom, you want to learn from them. And I wanted her to have my dressing room. I wanted her to have anything she wanted. I said, I don't care. I said, she, she opened doors for me and I could learn from her. And I did. And it was wondrous. I got some vines for New York's finest. Yeah, well, uh, we're on the job. Yeah, I'm on my J-O-B, too. Just like you. Oh, An important job. They want, you, you want to play the role of the nurse who falls in love with Paul Newman? I said, no. But you're good. I, I'd rather play Charlotte the junkie with no dialogue and I just kill and maim. <laughs> and they said, why? But but you want to be the love interest of Paul Newman? Said, no, I can be a love interest at any time. Not saying it was an easy role. You know, it just stopped me from kissing him. But I did the fact that I elected not to do that role and just do Charlotte. They were like, I'm going to work with Paul Newman and we're going to do an incredible political Love story. <gasps> yeah. And uh, we started developing it, and then he got sick, and, uh, and then he was unable to do it. But the fact that he said, I want you to do this with me. And he talked about his son had passed away from drugs. And we talked about a lot of things. And he said, You're, he just gave me the strength. He says, don't believe what they say about me as an actor. You know, don't, it has nothing to do with anything. It's about our humanness. He, he gave me unbelievable knowledge and tips and ideas. Silence by James Hathaway. It's a, a British novel. And um, yeah, get that one. That's good. And uh, when I read it, I went, oh my gosh. He says, we have to do this. I said, no, oh my gosh. It was right after Fort Apache, the Bronx. He was on me. He was on me. And I said, I really want to do theater. I want to test myself. You know, and it's hard if you have attractiveness, or the prettiness, and a lot of the attractiveness for male audiences, they think that they are sexually attracted to you um, and your marriage potential if they are physically attracted to you. And that was kind of scary because I thought, really? So if they're not sexual attracted to me, then they can't love me, we can't be married, we can't have family, we can't be partners. And so I was getting going into another realm of sexuality, attractiveness, movies, how it works, but, you know, what's, what's going on. And he said, you know, beautiful women can't be funny. And you're funny. Everyone else is trying to use makeup and eyelashes and this and this and this and this. He says, and you walk through just and I said that to somebody the other day. So sometimes you're pure and that's your most beautiful. And it was a man. And then the other times when you're not pure, you're hideous. You're a cop, Val. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A burnout cop, Rico, and you knew that. Uh, I wanted to work with a very aggressive, radical director and producer, Michael Mann and cutting edge, and we had real Colombian cartel working on the set, like that was scary. Uh, but we had innovative, we had really good actors. Don Johnson and Philip were very, very good. Is that what I think it is? What do you think it is? I think it's a gun pressed up against my dick. <laughs> well, you thought right, now take your hands from around my throat. Here's another white man lying his yeah, baby, I wrote a script for you. Oh, please. He says, no, no, really, I wrote it for you. It's a rum punch. Elmer and I said, Elmer Leonard? Oh, my gosh, because I, I read novels like crazy. You write Elmer Leonard. 
uh, Lee Charles, you know, uh, Lecay, I, like, really? He says, yeah, and I'll send it to you. I'll see what you think of it. Nothing. You, you won't be shooting and killing anybody. You're Jackie Brown. I can do that. The rest is history. But he says, we're going to rehearse. Not everybody rehearses with me. Not everybody's going to work with me. And you have to rehearse. I said, I rehearse. I've done nothing but theater. That's all I want. And he says, everybody, De Niro, Sam, everyone's rehearsing for two weeks. And he says, I, it's a lot of work, Pam. I need you to help me. We're going to be shooting out of continuity, and you have to remind me what we've done, where we're going, what we haven't done. I'm going, oh, pressure. And I think if I hadn't done five years of listening to solid theater, um, piano lesson, uh, Frank and Johnny the Claire de Lune, um, Fool for Love, Sam Shepard, uh, nothing but solid theater. I was ready, ready to work with him, and um, and have different temples with different actors and. And, and give him what he needed and uh, uses one or two takes and that the whole bunch was like, no, nah, we're on it. When you when he works you and you feel it and you're in the groove, man, it just flies. And I shadowed him on everything he did because I said, this is, this is what I wanna do. I know I can do this. I know I'm a maestro because I love instruments and I know the beats and sounds and everything of all different instruments like he does and the music that he provides. And I said, if I can just, and I learn, I write to music. I write of the times that the characters live in. So that gives me beats and, and swagger and clothes and colors and textures. And they asked me, well, you could have won a, an award for Jackie Brown. I said, no, because I was up against Helen Hunt and her dying son. I was not going to win because people project themselves into the roles and the situations of the actors in the story and not looking at what my Jackie had to do in certain situations to not be killed. She had to speak fast with Sam Jackson. Well, you, you know, if I didn't act out with this mother I'd be like going down the stairways, I said, I'm gonna kill myself. I did in one take. I don't know how I could speak that fast with Sam Jackson, walking down the steps, not looking at the steps. I, I knew I'm gonna say, Quentin, I'm gonna fall. Can we just finish with me lying down there on the steps saying, I can't keep up with this man. He talks so fast. Then Michael Keaton. And then it's Max Cherry. Hi, Max slows down and my heart is racing and I'm about to bug out because I my energy is slow down you're gonna be working with Max today okay blood it has to be at least 60 beats 50 beats per minute to work with Max Jerry and then it has to go to 130 beats to work with with Ordell hi I'm Olive I don't have any cheerleading experience but my husband and I, we take a tango class. Oh. It was either tango or divorce. I did Palms with Diane Keaton, and it was interesting playing an older woman, a grandmother or great-grandmother or whatever the ageism was. I'll sleep at lunchtime, but I, I gotta work with Diane Keaton. I gotta work with Diane Keaton because I wanted to ask her, what was it like when Al Pacino smacked you across the face? and you fell off the sofa and you couldn't talk anymore. Did you want to hit him back? Because if it was me, Shaniqua, I would have slapped the holy shit, we would have gone, we'd still be roll, rocking and rolling in that room. Wait, why you smack me? Are you kidding me? What time do you have? Seven. Maybe he got held up at his meeting. What time did he say he was gonna finish it was four o'clock? <sighs> That's not him, kid. When that Beth's mom took my dad away from my mom, cheating with, you know, Beth's mom, Gloria Steinem. And, um, and I, my storyline was always when I wrote my character's history, is that when we would be together as, as siblings, whether we'd be with my dad or be with her mom, we were up in the attic playing roles with costumes. She wanted to be Porgy the Man, I wanted to be Bess, who sold the strawberries on the street. And, um, and I knew, but she always fought, no, I'm, I'm Porgy, I want to be Porgy, I want to be the man, I want to be, and so, from, she had this aura of being very masculine, wanted to be dominant, wanted, wanted that. And I knew she was different. I didn't know how as a little girl, but that was my sister and I loved her, that we playmates. But I knew that she was different and wanted to be different and, and I gave her that. I wanted her to have that. 
to make her happy and make her safe. I was physical and she was cerebral. I have a, a film that I wanted to write about the L World girls. Same characters, everything. Mm -hmm. Alicia, Kate, Helen, Helena, who had the yacht, um, Max, everybody, all the girls. I had written a, a story that I ran by uh, Greenblatt, and he said, I like that story. Why did you? I, said, I pitched it to Eileen twice, and you know, it just didn't work or whatever, but I still have it as a movie, not as a series, as a two and a half hour movie for us. So I might get it done after I you know, clean the house, do my laundry in the barn.